say this. You're all I want. You're all I ever need. You're all I want. Help me know you are need. Say. Set my affection 
one magnificent obsession. Give me one glorious ambition for my life to know and follow hard after you. Give me one pure and holy passion. Give me one magnificent obsession. To know and follow hard after I said again, give me one pure and holy passion. Give me one magnificent obsession. Give me one glorious ambition for my life. To know
up your hands to him and just pray it. Pray it silently, but pray it from your heart. Pray it silently, but pray it from your heart. My heart is aching for your living springs. My heart is aching for you. All that I long for is found in your heart. You are everything I need. My soul is yearning for your living springs. My heart is aching for you. All that I long for is found in your heart. You are everything I need. You are the thirst. You are the stream. You are the hunger leaving deep inside of me. You are the food that satisfies. You are provision for the journey of my life. You are the thirst. You are the spring. You are the hunger leaving deep inside of me. You are the food that satisfies. You are provision for the journey of my life. You are everything.
are the thirst You are the spring You are the hunger Living deep inside You are the food That satisfies You are the vision for Journey of my life, Saint. You are the thirst. You are the thirst. You are the spring. You are the spring. You are the hunger leaving deep inside. You are the hunger leaving deep inside me. You are the food that satisfies. You are the food that satisfies.
this place. Let heaven find free course among us. In the atmosphere that governs this entire conference, let heaven and earth agree. In the thoughts that will go through every single mind, from the speakers to the listeners, let heaven and earth agree. Every action, every communication, let heaven and earth be made one here. Let your kingdom come. Let your will be done. We thank you, our Father. And by this, we declare Camp Meeting 2023 open. In the name of the Lord Jesus, someone shout amen. Come on, someone shout amen. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Please walk around, reach out to two, three, four people. Love upon them. Tell them, thank God you are here. Thank God you are here early. It's so good to see you. <laughs> we hunger and thirst for you. In a dry and weary so we want this year. We hunger and thirst for you in a dry and we relax. Cause all we want this year. We'll say that only three times. We hunger and thirst for you. We hunger and thirst for you. In a dry Exciting. Amen. Please take your seats in God's presence. Good morning, everyone. It's truly, truly exciting to have everyone in the house today. Amen. Hallelujah. Praise God. Would you celebrate everyone who traveled in? That's if everyone I'm seeing did not travel in. We are just church people. around I just wanted to be so hallelujah it's, it's going to be an amazing conference I mean it's going to be an amazing conference by the end of today I believe all of our speakers should be in amen so they're walking one after the other as we teach amen uh, I intended that this starts this early especially because of the session I'm about to teach yesterday my friends came in from Lagos and a few other cities amen Pastor Jude Woko and his wife, Dr. Fedro Woko. Will you help me celebrate them? Amen. <laughs> Pastor Ni and his wife from Olade um, Osunubi. Hallelujah. Praise God. Amen. Amen. I see sons and daughters of the house everywhere. Now I'm going to ask that we do something, okay? Um, pastors, please fill up the front seats so that anyone who comes in will not have to distract us, okay? Ushers, make sure that the seats are arranged tightly. By the end of today, there will be no room in this place. This morning, 106 of our spiritual sons left Kaduna at 6 a.m. to be here. From Layers of Truth, Pastor Doya Kerele. Um, I mean, 106 of them. They snapped their buses in convoy and sent to me this early morning. So, 
before the end of the day the entire place is going to be filled so i don't want us leaving spaces so that people are not you know squibbling themselves in amen i saw natalie and tina where are you oh, both of you come come and sit down here amen all the way from yobe amen as my son and his wife where's your wife i thought i saw your wife did she come oh where's she i'm not seeing now praise god all right praise god and if if you are a minister of the gospel sitting anywhere in the congregation just get your things quietly and come sit sit with the ministers either to my left here right in front of me amen 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 i will do all of the proper introductions a bit later my heart is on fire my, heart, my heart's on fire hallelujah. there's so much in my spirit to say in this camp meeting hallelujah so much in my spirit to say in this camp meeting so we'll take off without any further ado glory hallelujah it's good to have everyone in the house amen do we celebrate our pastors all of our pastors um, especially the ones that came from everywhere else but just we don't like just pastors we only like foreign pastors amen ahead of the god life assembly international in mina pastor daniel bauer amen the head of the god life assembly international in abuja and his wife pastor elisha ibrahim the head of the god life assembly makodi and his wife pastor tevi atsubu hallelujah the head of the god life assembly zaria and his wife pastor dr ben and dr mrs ben Minibe. amen hallelujah the head of the god life assembly Aimba. pastor Tsuli. Edobanya, amen. The head of the God Life Assembly, Abakliki, Pastor George Legba, who refused to come with his wife. And um, all of the people who came with them, the Lord bless you. Good, 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 good to have you, amen. A few of our sons who are heads of ministries and ministers in other ministries who are also here. We love you, Pastor Herman Dash. Christ nation Yola um, hallelujah praise God I will I'll get the time to introduce everyone properly later amen thank you guys thank you here I go okay I'm thinking of the time when I will stand and look into the eyes of my redeemer words won't come my way and deep inside my silent accolades I'll find my voice to see my Redeemer And I know upon this earth I'll never find The words that can express my heart or mine When we is this world that ends he spoke and pulled my dark soul from the night. How can I repay my redeemer? And I know upon this earth I'll never find. express my heart or mine so here I go again I'm thinking of the time 
when I will stand and look into the eyes of my redeemer. It's a finishing line and the responsibility is on me to give you a clear understanding of the things that I believe God is saying to us in this season. Just so that as speaker upon speaker comes, we can all arrive at the true understanding of what God is saying in this season. I hope you came with a jotter. Did you come to a Oh, we decided we're not sharing one this year. Amen. If you can get a jotter, I'll do my best today to lay out certain things systemically. And it will give a framework to all of the teachings that I will personally do. I don't know what the Lord has placed in the heart of the other people who are coming to speak or sound in the conference. Amen. Or oh, when I was introducing, he had stepped out. Minister Moses Akko is in the house. Hallelujah. Praise God. It's good to have you more. And uh, I look forward. I look forward. Amen. Minister David Inkeno will join us, I believe, tomorrow. Hallelujah. I mean, just awesome, awesome things. Amen. Now, the responsibility is upon me to bring us clear understanding as to the things that the Lord laid in my heart very strongly as I prepared, you know, or as we declared the team, the finishing line. Now, if you met any of the publicity materials, especially one in which I was speaking, I took the time to explain what Hebrews chapter 11 attempted to lay out. Laid out a strong pedigree of amazing, amazing people who by faith, the Bible says, subdued kingdoms, they wrought righteousness, sought the mouths of lions, changed seasons, started new days on the earth. I mean, amazing, amazing pedigree of people contained in Hebrews 11. Of course, like you all know, many of the times I feel like Hebrews 11 is not even properly represented in the mind of the average believer because as it is many of us cannot see the hallmark of faith for some of the people who were spoken of there for instance i'll give you three examples and i'll skip one is barak some people don't even know who barak is in the bible and they will read hebrews 11 and see time will fail off because barak another one is jephthah I'm calling them proper order. The Bible spoke about Barak, spoke about Jephthah. Ah, I thought I begged the pastors to fill the seats in front. Please, let us, amen. Pastors, please fill up the seats so that when the rest of the pastors come, they can file in behind. Thank you. Amen. Sorry, that, that was a major obstruction in my teaching. Praise God. Now, please hear me. I'm doing this so that there's sufficient order in the house. If anybody comes in, they're able to slip in quietly without distracting us. There's so much bubbling in my spirit in this camp meeting. All right? I said, the second one is Jephthah. Some people don't know who Jephthah is in the Bible. Maybe the only Jephthah they know is my spiritual son who sang, blow, blow, blow like a mighty wind. They don't know any Jephthah. Now, the third one, which... I believe um, is often misrepresented. In fact, many people, if they had their way, would have erased him from that hallmark of faith. Is Samson? Because, of course, as traditional folklore has it, the moment you say Samson, it's and Delilah. Are you following me? But the Bible considered what Samson did great enough and worthy of mention in the hallmark of faith of those who time failed to speak about are you following me now so hebrews 11 has that layout of great amazing amazing people 
who did great things on the earth but i want to show you twice in hebrews chapter 11 something that was repeated hebrews 11 12 can you give me hebrews chapter 11 verse 12 Uh, HOD, please find me somebody who knows how to find scripture and do it on time. To man that console that is showing me scripture. It's still the beginning of the conference, so I can still do a bit of housekeeping. Brother, you want? It's not sorted for now. Is this forever? Okay. All right, so Hebrews eleven twelve, Amen. That's going to be the last house I'll do. It goes out of order. The Lord will fix it. Amen, amen, amen. Hebrews eleven twelve, are you there? Therefore sprang there of one, and he as good as dead. So many as the stars of the sky in multitude, and as the sun which is by the seashore, innumerable. Thirteen, which is where I was actually going to. Thirteen. Please use your Bible. These all died in faith, not having received the promises, but having seen them afar off and were persuaded of them and embraced them and confessed that they were what? Strangers and pilgrims on the earth. For they that say such things, do what? Declare plainly, that they seek a country or they seek a city and truly if they had been mindful of that country from whence they came out they might have had opportunity to have returned verse 16 but now they desire a better country that is an heavenly country wherefore god is not ashamed to be called their God for he has prepared for them a city now please listen to this listen the Bible started with a patriarchal lineage and in that patriarchal lineage there were only a few people mentioned please listen to me very carefully the people who were mentioned in that first lineage of faith were Abel who offered a more excellent sacrifice than Cain right the second person who was mentioned in that lineage of faith was Enoch who, who, who gave us the foundation for pleasing God and please keep the understanding of pleasing God somewhere in your heart because we're coming to it who pleased God and the Bible says God took him he was not he suddenly disappeared then the third one was Noah right who faith ended one reign of the earth and began a new re re reign of the earth and if you read peter's writing in second peter chapter 3 you will find out that peter took the leverage to divide the earth on noah all right because peter said that earth which then was and the earth which now is and when he said the earth which then was he was referring to the earth that passed away by water is written clear are you following me please note that this committee is going to be a committee for bible students so when i mention those kind of things make sure you either make a mental note or a natural note to go and check so peter tells you that the fate of noah was the splitting of dispensations so that noah faith that could end one dispensation and start a new dispensation so that peter could take the liberty of saying the world that then was being on water established upon water perished in water and then he said and the world that now is will not be destroyed by water it will now be destroyed by fire are you following me now maybe it's too early to take a job but that's part of the reasons why satan wants to defile the symbol called the rainbow Do you understand it because change of dispensations the rainbow was given in fact i'm going to start a rainbow movement is anybody hearing me and that rainbow movement will be in fact that rainbow will be a reminder that this present earth will be destroyed by fire 
Because it's not for nothing. Satan does not, he doesn't do anything carelessly. Are you following me? It mean that everybody who was involved was possessed. I suspect they are though. Because how come your apple cannot be an apple unless they bite it? Okay. No, it's okay. It's fine. Just in case you get me. Do you understand it? Uh -huh. Very strong inspiration. But it must have come from somewhere. How come your apple cannot be an apple unless they bite it? No, you didn't get it. When you get, did you get it? Okay, good. It tells you that there's a rebellious movement on the earth, and the rebellious movement is gaining stature. It's gaining blatantness. It, it is coming out in your face to say to you, "We defile God, and we have no regrets." And a decision a few weeks ago. Is this going to work for us or should we expect another? Eh? Sir, the first one. All these modern facilities, I don't just understand it. It's just roll paper like this, like this. And give me, let me shout inside. <laughs> Praise God. Is anybody getting. Is anybody getting me? Come on, are you getting me? Now, I was speaking about Noah and the splitting of dispensations. And why God gave the sign, the rainbow. And how that you now live in a generation where the signs that God gave, that are supposed to be reminders, have become signs of rebellion. So that very soon, when those signs are seen, the world does not think about God. Does it make sense to you? So that you understand that you are standing in a deliberate time. It's one of the things that must mark the finishing line. In fact, let me take the liberty here to say that in Matthew 24, when the Lord Jesus was asked about the signs of the end of times, the first thing he said is do not be deceived. And you will find out that in the Lord Jesus' signs of the end of times, he had more of what Satan would do than what God will be doing in that season. That's to say to you that you are not approaching the finishing line until you have stopped being unaware of the devil's devices. Are you following me? Scripture didn't call us to exalt Satan. Scripture didn't call us to, to fear Satan. But scripture told us that we must be sober and vigilant. Scripture said we cannot be unaware of what Satan is doing. That means Satan thrives when people are drunk, unaware. Come on, come on, come on, saints. So listen to me. And the Bible didn't say war against Satan. He just told you that if you are actually sober and vigilant, he is defeated. Oh. I hope somebody got me. Oh, speech I was saying first chapter number five. Be sober, be vigilant. For your adversary, the devil, walk it about like a roaring lion. We took many years emphasizing like that he's not a roaring lion, but he's like a roaring lion. But that scripture is very clear about the fact that he can also devour. So whether he's like or he is, take note that he can devour. But his power to devour is not in strength. His power to devour is in wits. So the Bible keeps telling you, don't be deceived. In fact, the first words of the Lord Jesus, when he spoke about the end of time, is do not let anyone deceive you. That means if there's anything that is required in this time, it is the accuracy of knowledge. Oh. Are you following me? It means that it is up to you and not for argument's sake. It is up to you to be sure and extra sure that what you know is the way you know it, the way God established it. 
Because if what you know is not the way you know it, the way God established it, you might wake up and find out that you are standing upon a line from where if Satan comes to devour, there's nothing you can do. Are we together? Come on, saints, are we together? So be sober, be vigilant. For your adversary, the devil, walk it about like a roaring lion. Seeking whom he may devour. Verse 9. Whom you should resist, how? Steadfast in the faith, knowing that the afflictions he's bringing to you was also accomplished in your brethren that are in the world. Are you following me? Now, please, let's go back on that talk. So I told you, three people were first mentioned. Who? Abel, Enoch, and Noah. And Abel was mentioned for the sake of his sacrifice. Right? Enoch was mentioned for his ability to have pleased God and found a way back to undo the fall. We'll talk about that a little later. And then Noah was mentioned for his ability to split times, judge and condemn one generation and establish the reign of God in the next generation. If you got that, let me hear an amen. Immediately afterward, then they spoke about Abraham. Are you with me? They spoke about Abraham. And when they spoke about Abraham, they literally closed the chapter. But they gave you a picture that seemed to have in the natural only been related to Abraham. But the Bible says this all. I'll come again. Just in case you didn't hear me. They gave you a picture afterward. That in the natural only related to Abraham. But in the statement of that scripture, Pastor David. They said these all. Give us verse 13 again. What did these all do? Hebrews eleven thirteen. These all did what? Died in faith. Not having received the promises. Now it's important. We will have to dig out these promises. But having seen them afar off and were persuaded of them and embraced them and confessed. So there were a number of things there. Let's keep it. Let's keep those things in perspective. That means personally, they set out on a journey. They didn't arrive at the destination. But they were satisfied that God chose them to begin the journey. And they were sure that they were sure that they were sure that they did not waste their time. They were sure that they were sure that they were sure that a generation was going to come that will embrace in themselves the fullness of the promises that made them start their journey. Oh, they don't say amen in this church. They don't, they don't say amen in this church. All right? Right? They were persuaded. They embraced the promise that was yet to come. That means they lived for something whose ultimate outcome they knew they were not going to see. And yet the conviction of the outcome and its benefit for God and the earth was sufficient for them to die not having embraced what they set out for. And when they were dying, they were satisfied that if they, all they did was take a step in the direction of this thing that they have seen afar off, it was sufficient for them to go to rest. And the Bible said every one of them considered themselves pilgrims and strangers. That means every one of them was on a journey that came out from the shore and was headed to the onshore but the onshore was more attractive to them than the shore because the bible still said to you right there that if they were mindful of that city from whence they came they surely would have had reasons to return that means their staying focus was not the absence of reasons that means they were hard pressed many times and in their hard press they should have considered the option of returning 
But now faith is the Did you did you just get the definition of faith? Let me tell you the real problem more. The real problem was that when we define faith, we define faith for a generation in personal terms. We did not define faith for a generation in kingdom terms. And in kingdom terms, the ultimate end of all faith is to fulfill the dream of God, not to make you great. And for them, being participants in the dream of God, even if they died destitute, was greater glory than arriving at any form of achievement in the natural that they could have been able to hold on to and refer to. This year, let me throw, let me throw you a question. The last time Satan almost depressed you, that your results were not outstanding, what was the basis he used? Did he use the basis of God's assessment of things that were eternal? Or the immediate assessment of what results are coming out of your life? And what you possibly did not put consciously into clear consideration is the fact that plenty of the results you were even seeing today were products of labors that many people labored before you came. They were not necessarily. The Lord Jesus said, I invited you to harvest upon fields where you are bestowed no labor. Does that make you better than the generation that bestowed labor? So if the generation that bestowed labor, Pastor Judith, didn't see any result, did it make them a failure? So that, that's why Hebrews chapter 11 can never make sense. That's why when people teach it, many people cannot teach it holy. The reason is because to teach it holy, you have to look beyond yourself. How do you tell a woman that God suspended her womb for 25 years because she was writing a story? How do you convince that woman that the story of God was more important than her nursing a child? Listen, these are the finishing line thoughts. Because if we are not able to sell these thoughts across the church of Jesus, what will happen is that there will not be a generation that is focused enough to know that because we are being elected to finish, we cannot permit the little things of this life distract us. Blessed be God for children. But whether they come or not, there's a story he's writing. Blessed be God for wealth. Whether it comes or not. Blessed be God for ministry success. Whether it comes or not. Blessed be God for the open door to the nations. Whether it comes or not. Let my primary drive be. Am I still in the center of God's story? And am I adding to what was passed on to me? Because the Bible took the time to show you. That with the outstanding results that you thought. Because not every outstanding result in scripture is an outstanding result. What did Abel get for his faith? He died. No. The reward of Abel for offering a more excellent sacrifice than Cain was that he died. For him to speak after he died was what God was looking for. God wanted the voice of his blood. No, no. I, I wish you heard me. What God wanted out of Abel was the voice of his blood. What is recorded against him as faith is the voice of his blood crying from the ground. That's why when you speak about faith, you are more comfortable speaking about Enoch. Because when you speak about Enoch, there's a superhuman, super hype, and we are the generation that will enter that. Anyways, I'm coming there. I'm coming there. This is the conference for it. 
In this conference I'm going to teach you, I will show you that the generation of the rapture is not a generation that Jesus suddenly said, let's go and pick them. Porum, porum. No, no, no. That generation will be ready. Those are the people who would have entered into the heart of Paul and understood why Paul said to Timothy that Christ brought life and immortality to light by the gospel. Listen, this, this conference is for soldiers. This conference is for people who have decided that their lives are laid down. This conference is not for people who are tasting Jesus to see what will come out of him. This conference is for those who have said whether nothing comes out of this Jesus. It is a singular privilege of a lifetime to add to what the patriarchs of faith have done. And if it leaves us destitutes in sheepskin and goatskin, as only as Jesus is glorified, we are satisfied. Are you with me? Because the contention around faith, you see, let me tell you the truth. The popularity, wealth, ministry results, what else? Children, what are the other things that worry us every day? Fame. All of those things cannot be used for God if they did not die in God. You see, a man who is concerned about them cannot use them for God. Leave it. I'm not saying he will not contribute for church program because he has money. I'm saying he can never translate resource into divine assignment. So listen to this, foundationally. Because if we are the finishing line generation, then we must understand what the finishing line thoughts are. What did God design the concluding generation to look like? Very important thoughts. So, the Bible said, these all died by faith, not having received the promise, but seeing them afar off, they were persuaded of them and embraced them. How do you embrace what is afar off? Now, faith is the substance of things. Of truth. The evidence of things. Nothing. So if somebody embraced what is afar off, it means that he started to live for what has not been manifest. And he lived like he was preparing for it. So God has to reckon for that man in the age of the manifestation of that thing he lived for. See, I just jumped far ahead of myself to say something I thought I would be saying on the third day. On the third day of this conference, part of the things that I intend that you will see is how that faith is the elongation of your life. And the return of the saints to the earth is on the strength of the faith they live by. Sir, Pastor George, please stand on the other end for me. No, come up, come up, come up, just like me. Give a wide view for those who are online. Listen, if that is what I see, and I see it now, everything around me is not living for that. Everything around me is living for everything around them. I am living for that. Listen, and the Bible says, while I'm living here, Napoleon. I embrace them. That means that was more a reality to me than the things. Do you now understand why Paul invited you and said to you, while we look not at the things which are seen, for they are temporal. But we look at the things that are not seen, for the things that are not seen are eternal. Now, if I live here for there, and I die here, the God for whom I lived here for there, has to make sure that in the day when a generation takes the final step into this, I come back to live in the day I always look for. That's how saints will be compelled back into the earth. It's not, this is not one trumpet. Para, para. Then you tell them, pack your things, we are going. Everything in God is clearly stated in principles and prophecies. 
and if you understand the principles and the prophecies then you will know that even if I was living here I was living upon the strength of journeys that people took from there so if they are taking journeys from there to here I don't start my journey from there I start it from here and starting it from here where's in my mind the responsibility for everyone who has lived so far then imagine what responsibility is on the generation that is living here how many generations do they owe because you will soon find out that faith is a released energy into the atmosphere that never dies faith is not just men believing God faith is a released energy in the atmosphere that compels the earth and conjures the earth into that so once a reality has been lived on the earth the earth has been damaged forever every generation can live in it it is on the strength of that legality Pastor George, that please understand this it's on the strength of that legality that Satan wants to do his best to end the knowledge of God so that the things that are traditionally Christian can die. Hoping that a generation will rise that will not remember what had been done. Every time you heard of dark ages on the earth, that was the time. So at the end of the day, it is so that one generation can rise that will lose the knowledge of the journeys of God that was made before them. Paradventure, Satan can get the generation to start back from here. Oh, but Romans 5 is boiling in my heart. Won't come to teach the promises. You'll see them. Paul wrote them out clearly. Romans 4, Romans 5, Romans 6. He, he wrote them out clearly. The problem was that there was not a generation or their hitherto had not been a generation that was conscious about the better covenant established upon better promises. That means what drives a covenant, Pastor Theo, is the promise. That means a generation cannot say they have a covenant with God until they know the promise bound to the covenant so that they can, when they stand to say he's a covenant keeping God. What they are saying is that he has fulfilled the promises bound to the covenant. Every covenant is bound with promises. Is the God of Abraham, Isaac and Jacob, Jehovah the man of war. His mercies endureth forever. Oh. His holiness, the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, Jehovah, the man of war, his mercies endureth forever and ever. Oh, praise his holiness. Say it again. The God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, Jehovah, the man of war, his mercy endure. His mercy endure forever and praise his holiness. Say one more time. Say the God of Abraham, Isaac and Jacob, Jehovah the man of war, say his mercy endure forever and ever. Please take note of that last statement because everything in this conference will hang around it. We have to be conscious that we have better prom better covenant and we have to be conscious that it is established upon better promises. 
so that we we know that we are not in covenant with God until we know the promises and I'm glad that we have laid the faith foundation so that you understand that the ultimate promises of the covenant have nothing to do with your personal life are you following me? of course your life will tell of the praises of God in the various dimensions of God that he chooses to glorify himself in your life he chooses to glorify himself in his glory he can reveal dimensions of himself to you or in you that has not been seen in previous generations and so if you read the hallmark in Hebrews chapter 11 in each one of them was a unique revelation of a dimension of the glory of God that was possibly not seen in others and yet this all died in faith not having obtained the promises that means the promises was not that thing you saw in their lives shut the mouth of lions is not the promises women receive their dead again to life is not the promises oh, I wish somebody was hearing me that means that the unique dimension of God that was revealed in them was an evidence that they were on a journey but the promises were still afar off and if it was afar off then it must have been given to somebody else to fulfill that means there's a generation that before we start finishing line we must honor the generation that enjoyed adding to our journey knowing that they will never see the result so you see we have God to honor as a finishing line generation we, are, we have saints to honor as a finishing line generation listen let me tell you the intent of the last step, statement Ruel the intent of the last statement is so that when you wake up in the morning you don't feel like you are living alone you need to feel like there's a portion of Timothy's body a portion of Paul's body a portion of the body of Abraham some of Jephthah's own understand that when you wake up everything on the grand son of heaven is looking and saying yeah now our journey continues oh I wish you heard me If you woke up with that kind of consciousness, not too many things within present time will trouble you. And if you don't live like that, you truly don't understand the covenant to which you were invited. So hear this. The Bible now told you that they saw it above. They were standing here. They embraced it. They were fully persuaded. They embraced the promises. And they confessed that they were pilgrims and strangers. Then they said, the reason was because they were looking for a city. Hey. And the Bible told you that that city is not an earthly city. It's a heavenly one. Matthew chapter 6. Let your kingdom come. Let your will be done on earth as it is done where? In heaven. That means that the city they are seeking for, when we say it's a heavenly city, we're not necessarily saying they are seeking for heaven. What they were looking for is the system that governs heaven becoming manifest among men. And so, every man, listen to this, and this will shape your Christian culture every man who meets God becomes intoxicated with God's system so this world is not my home I'm just a passing to the heaven is not my home now when you hear those kind of statements you can push it away as an old song but what it's saying is my heart cannot rest Say, and I can't feel at home in this world. The reason is, listen to this very carefully. When the reality of the city that I have been promised embraces me. What happens is that the city that I now live in lose their taste, lose, loses its, its taste. So I consistently mourn so that I can be 
comforted. Oh, oh Kai, Kai. Oh. I'll come again. Listen. A part of me is praying that you embrace this statement and run with it. Meaning, listen to this. The degree of comfort I feel in this present reality, Pastor Wisdom, the degree of comfort I feel and seek in this world is the degree of the absence of the understanding of the operation of the world to which I was invited. Sounds very harsh, but absolutely true. And I'll take the last example of those first four and use that to help you see it. So you now understand why Abraham did not build a city. You now understand why Abraham lived in tents. You now understand why Abraham did not seek to be a king. Even though life presented him the opportunity to have become a king. You now understand the reason why. The reason was because you, you now understand the reason why Abraham will stand in Genesis 15. And God will say to him, this was the land I promised you. Then Abraham will say in his hand, this cannot be the land you promised me. You know, you know some of you don't read the dramas and the conjectures in scripture it was in Genesis 15 that God was speaking to Abraham and he told him ah, you know this is the land I was going to bring you to but your children after four generations will now become slaves then they will enter into a strange land they will treat them harshly then I will come then I will bring them out then I will give them this land then the Bible now came to tell you later in Hebrews chapter 11 that he was looking for a city that had foundations that means when God was saying to him this is the land I promised you Abraham said to himself, this cannot be it. Now, that's the reason why Israel inherited the land, but they did not inherit. Oh. I wish you heard me. They inherited the land, but the promise. So, Abraham knew that the eternal God cannot promise me a temporal city. And that if in the core of my essence, I was invited into his image and his likeness, the only thing I can be comfortable around is what he's comfortable around. Now, that's how you birth a generation that becomes wealthy, but it's not swallowed up by its wealth. That becomes famous and it's not swallowed up by fame. So it's not a kneel down by my bed and say to God, Lord, please help me with my pride. That you still have a pride means you have not seen the city. So if God decides to help you with your pride, he does not subdue or humiliate you. He reveals the city to you. Then where you stand now and the reason why men glory around you will lose effect before your eyes. In that day, your name will become bigger than you. Your money will become bigger than you. When you walk into a place, it's, it's the way they are celebrating the name that makes you remember, oh, God gave me a name. It's absolutely nothing to you. It's only as useful as how God will use it. Because what you were looking for when you set out to seek him was not a name. Listen, and if you have listened to me from the morning till now, you will know that the first thing God is doing on the finishing line is his cutting of our distractions. Because if we don't set our eyes on Jesus, the author and the perfecter of our faith, who for the joy set before him endured the cross, despising his shame, and is now set at the right hand of the majesty on high, if the distractions are not taken, every time Satan wants to take your race, what he does is he sets something on your pathway. Pastor George, so your church is still this small. The moment he says that to you, then you leave the assignment God gave you and enter into the strategy for church growth. We bow before your throne and we proclaim our God is worthy. Lift up his name. For he is worth, we sing it again. 
forever and ever in adoration we bow before your throne and we proclaim our God is might lift up his name for he is holy we sing it again Forever and ever In adoration We bow before your throne We sing it again Forever and ever In adoration We bow before your throne We sing it again Forever and ever In adoration We bow before your throne Sing it again And we proclaim Our God is mighty We lift up his name For he is holy We sing it again Forever and ever In adoration We bow before your throne Say it one more time And we proclaim Our God is mighty Our God is mighty Lift up your name Lift up your name For you are holy For you are holy Sing it again In adoration, we bow before the throne. So Abraham was standing in the land that it looked like God promised him. And God told him, this is the land. Abraham said, this cannot be the land. <laughs> no, you, don't, you don't know what it means? For All faith is based on the word of God. So if God says to a man, this is the land I promised you. And the man said, no, this cannot be it. Now you understand why God calls Abraham the father of faith. That Abraham could hear beyond what God was saying. And saw the reality of who God was. And matched the promises of God with the person of God. Man, just in case you thought I was exalting Abraham. I'm actually confronting you. How many things did God promise you that were supposed to be divine? That you move from the divine into the mundane. And in the day you received the mundane, you spoke about your faith almost as though you had conquered. And heaven was looking at you and saying, even though you obtained a result, you are not found pleasing. Because Israel obtained a result. He subdued kings before them. Yet with that generation, he was not pleased. Because the tendency in our humanity is to take the divine and interpret it in the mundane. And the moment we achieve the mundane, we speak about the mundane as though it is an achievement of faith. What we did not know is that the faithfulness of God cannot cause him to fail even when we are foolish. Thank you, Pastor. Now, I needed you to get that clear picture of how a generation can see from afar and embrace it. Now you understand finally why scripture says faith is a substance of things hoped for. That means you must be able to stand here, embrace a reality that you will never see. Live by it, be mocked for it. And be satisfied knowing that you added to the journey of faith like the patriarchs. So indeed, it begins by honoring the fact that this journey didn't begin by, with us. And that's part of the reasons why 
the best picture for this journey of faith is more a relay than it is a marathon or a sprint. It's more a relay than it is a marathon or a sprint. But you know that even in a relay, the last runner has to run fast. Part of the responsibilities of the last runner is to recover. Oh, de Marco Parada. Oh, I wish that generation heard me. Part of the responsibility of the last runner is to recover. Every gain lost in time, a generation is designed to recover it. And I came in this camp meeting to announce to you, this is that generation. How do we know that this is that generation? I've told you again and again. The word of God is not understood because you read it. The word of God is revealed by the person of God. So when God begins to call the attention of the church in the direction of certain thoughts, then you know that the season for the birthing of that thought has come. So you don't understand the word of God because it's written. There are many things that are, are written that have not yet been revealed. In the day they are revealed, it will almost be like this is, is today they wrote this scripture. You won't understand it until you understand that the angel of the Lord said to Daniel, seal up the words of this book for it's not time. And you thought that seal up, Dr. Judith, will mean that what he wrote, he now hid somewhere and put inside can and say, I'll throw it inside the Red Sea. Then, no, seal up simply means I agree with God. It's not time for this. It is sealed. That means that a man is reading it like this. He cannot understand it. In fact, I, the beauty of scripture as I see them now is so beautiful. That scriptures were read through time, interpretations were drawn out of them that were necessary for that season, but it was never the prophecy of that scripture. In the day of the prophecy of that scripture, it suddenly becomes plain. Then the generation says, we never understood this. This is how you know that we're approaching the line. When God begins to call, call our attention, I'm, oh my God, wait until we get to Romans chapter 5. You will see the promises written that you possibly have never seen. And it was always there. So, Hebrews 11, 13. Okay, sorry, 14. For they that say such things, declare plainly that they seek a country. And then verse 15 said to you, and truly if they had been mindful of that country from which they came, they would have had opportunity to return. Does that remind you of some people? Huh? Does that remind you of some people? Which people? Israel. Do you realize that every time they faced an opposition, what was the first thing they told Moses? Now you will understand why Hebrews chapter 4 told you that they, were, they didn't have faith. Woo. I'd given instructions that you listen to the, oh, oh, it's not that teaching. The teaching I did in Abuja church, it was the groan they gave you to listen to, right? Pastor Elisha, is it? Yes, yes. The Redeemer. That's the group. Yes. Same message. There was a message I preached Saturday night when I came to you guys. Please make it available tonight. Hey, can you spare two hours to listen to one message? Because your break is 13 hours. The session is 11 hours. The break is 13 hours. If by reason of strength we'll do 12 12. You know it's possible. And so, Amen. Please spare to us. They, ay. Because if you don't understand, Lord, can we do this now? Please flash my time. Flash my time. Lord, can we do this now? Thank you. Uh. So, let's go. So, you now understand why Israel consistently was thinking backwards. And every time you think backward, God declares his displeasure in your direction. Hebrews chapter 10, close by saying, now the just shall live by faith. If any man draws back, my soul will have no pleasure in him. Then he said, but we are not of them that draw back to perdition. We are of them that believe. That means the saving of the soul is one of the promises. I'm coming there. Yes. That's why I told you, it's written in plain sight. 
but many times until he, light is shown upon it that means that one of the clear promises of the new testament that is a better promise established upon a better covenant or a better covenant established upon a better promise one of the promises of this covenant is that our souls will be saved oh, praise God. Ah. Oh, praise God. now you understand why first chapter 1 verse 10 said receiving the end of your faith which is the, of which salvation the prophets spoke they searched and inquired diligently Searching what kind of people and what manner of time the spirit of Christ which was in them did signify when he spake beforehand of the sufferings of Christ and the glories that shall follow. The saving of the soul. The saving of the soul is one of the promises of the finishing line. It is on the saving, it's on the premise of the saving of the soul that the demortification of the body happens. That the body that is decaying can now receive new life. But it's a good place to say an amen. You know why? Because if you heard the Redeemer, the message I recommended for you. I showed you the reason why oh sorry those of you who didn't get the recommendation forgive us we'll find a way to make it available to everyone it's a groan i showed in that teaching that every groaning is upon the strength of mortality it's the failure of the body that causes groaning second corinthians 5 romans after 8 every groan you find in the new testament is hung around that means that God designed such that as the time has passed and our bodies are failing more because in that teaching I showed you that there was a progression in Psalm 90. I didn't teach Psalm 90 there, but I taught Psalm 90 before. That there's a progression in Psalm 90 that reveals that even the mortality of man is increasing with time. So when man first fell, men could still live 900 years, 960 years, 930 years. Years later, men like Job, who was said to be before Abraham, could live two full lifetimes and have two full set of children and live to see those two full set prosper. Because as at the time when Satan tested him, all ten of his children were living in their houses. It's in your Bible. You see, we think about the trial of Job, we don't think about the customs of Job. How did Job raise family so that when all 10 of his children were established, they still had a culture of meeting with each other? Yeah. There, there are questions to ask when you read scripture. That years, imagine, that years after your children have gone, Michael, uh, Osborne, Lester, Long after they are gone, established in different cities, they keep a culture of coming back together. Just to feast and laugh. Who raised them? There are questions to ask. Satan brought down all ten children of Job at once. He lived in ashes. Bible scholars said for about a year. And you heard that God restored Job. Because you read it in one sentence. You thought it happened in one day. That means Job learned how to start to raise sheep again. Raise goats again. Raise asses again. Raise cows again. Change hey, change pampas again. And with every progress... Job didn't regret what he lost. He rejoiced at watching God advance. Even if his wife gave birth every nine, nine months, to give birth to ten children, she needs at least eight years. A man of faith is never afraid to begin again. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. 
and when he starts again he does not start on the regret of what he lost he starts counting the goodness of God again bit by bit piece by piece he celebrates the fact that they are growing faster now than they grew the first time there's hope ahead of me and that's sufficient to keep the heart of the man of faith stable And I told you there that every every dish, every progression in, in death, every disaffection in your body was supposed to be a call to grow. Ah. What do men use it to do? We don't use it to grow. We use it to look for quick solutions. In fact, I told you in that message that many of us cancel our groaning with food. So when the things that are supposed to make you groan rise up before your eyes. Because nobody likes the feeling. And the reason why you don't groan is because you have not seen the heavenly city. If you see the heavenly city, the earthly one will lose taste. If they tell you you will become the president... Of the United Nations, if the United Nations was a federation, it will still not be strong enough to satisfy the discontent that comes into your heart, knowing how much man had failed. Now, please understand this. Then he hopped to a second set, and then in the second set, he began to speak about the people who rose up after Israel had failed. Who I have to speak about the failure of Israel today. Start, started to speak about the people who rose up after Israel failed. Now, let me help you understand after Israel failed. You remember that story in the wilderness? Let's not skip it. You remember that story in the wilderness, right? Go to Hebrews chapter 4. Thank you, Lord Jesus. Praying the Spirit for the next 15 to 20 seconds. Just pray in the Spirit. Write these things indelibly in your heart. Write them, write them, write them in your heart. Write them indelibly in your heart. Write them indelibly in your heart. Ye prabha ko siya tashtahan ya makaroba diya da kataya. E ra prabha papa sotena galapa diya stale e kramana noskena. E ra papa bo sevena staka libra handia da katia. E ra bo lebegia tabasto hiya nastahaya. Rando brebeke diya bakado sebe diya stahane. E ra prabha bo sina kadabba hundia brakelundia tasha. In the name of Jesus. Hebrews 3 7. I read it very quickly. I run into Hebrews chapter 4 and we will very likely close this session there. I still will have some time to teach later. So, Hebrews 2, 7. Wherefore as the Holy Ghost said. Now, please listen to this very carefully because you're going to have to see this in the Old Testament. Wherefore as the Holy Ghost said. Today, if you want, if you will hear his voice, what? Harden not your heart as God called it the provocation so that you are not in doubt. Read on. One, two, three, go. In the day of the temptation where? In the wilderness. Next verse. When your fathers tempted me, they proved me and they saw my works. How long? Did you hear saw my works? That means that the works of God are present with a generation. Does not mean that God is pleased with that generation. They saw my works 40 years. Wherefore I was grieved with that generation. And said, what we read it. One, two, three, go. One. Stop. That means there were two problems. They had a heart deficiency and a knowledge deficiency. That means their heart was not true. Their knowledge was not complete. Their heart was not true. Ooh. Keep me true. Oh Jesus, keep me true. Keep me true. Lord Jesus, keep me true. There's a race I must run. 
There's a victory I must win. Give me power every hour to be true. To be true. There's a race I must fight. There's a victory I must win. Give me power every hour to be true. Let's listen to this. If we must obtain. I take to first Corinthians chapter 10 and show you something there very quickly and come back. If we must obtain, we must take note of the things that the generation that did not obtain lacked. Right? Now, God speaking said, These guys provoked me and they lacked the ability to finish the covenant I had with Abraham because, number one, they are in their hearts. Number two, because they have not known my ways. Hebrews chapter 4 verse 2, the Bible says that the word that was sent to them did not profit them. Why? It was not mixed with faith in them that heard it. And we just define faith as a substance of things hoped for. And the evidence of things not seen. Just imagine Pastor George there again. Do you remember that we said that the fathers who collected this faith saw the faith from afar and embraced it here those guys were not willing to embrace here what is there as far as they are concerned so far today so the matter was always our food our drink our worship our pleasure that was what killed Israel in the wilderness First Corinthians chapter 10 oh come on come on come on alright that means that they can be angry with God because there's a result they need today that didn't come. So their faithlessness was not in an absence of acknowledging God. It was that they wanted God to do now what they want now. Yes. Hey, I, I'm coming. Please don't only think about Israel. Hebrews 4 2. For unto us was the gospel preached as well as. That means the same word, the same quality, same kind of messengers. As well as unto them. So, but the word preached did not profit them, not be mixed with faith in them that heard it. So the warning was three and four, quickly. Three and four, three and four. For we which do believe enter into rest. As he said, as I sworn my wrath, if they shall enter into my rest. Although the works were finished. All right. Sorry, the warning is in verse 1. Warning, verse 1, verse 1, verse 1. The warning is in verse 1. Verse 1, Hebrews 4, 1, Hebrews 4, 1, Hebrews 4, 1. Let us therefore what? Let's a... Let us... Uh-huh. Oh, yeah. Pastor George, can we do this again? Please. So, that's the promise. Their fathers embraced it from here. As far as they are concerned, that's not their business. The culture of Egypt, the culture of Egypt, the culture of Egypt takes away the ability to live by faith. That's why the Lord Jesus in the New Testament, Matthew chapter 6 and Luke chapter 12 told you, do not worry about your life. That means the presence of worry is a clear sign that you have not seen where God is going. You are not participating in what he's building. Woo! arrive at the place where if Satan has to touch you, he has to touch what God is doing. Go and check all of the frustrations of Paul. His frustration, lack of money was never one. Every time Satan needed to touch Paul, he had to touch the assignment. So many times, he will stir up people who Paul thought were brethren and then they will fail him. Those were the things that got Paul Hey. did you hear what they said concerning Daniel we will find nothing against this man except 
If you are still alive, let me hear you say an amen. amen. Now listen. That means, if this generation had followed on, I mean the guys in the wilderness, and they had arrived here, it would have been Uhuru. We would have just shouted glory, hallelujah, and it would have been gone. But, Pastor Faye, thank God they failed. Because their failure left us a promise. Oh, did you see that in Hebrews 4? Let us therefore fear. So as much as we rejoice, we also fear. What are rejoicing? They did not enter so we can enter. That means this thing God is calling us to enter, he had attempted to make one generation before us enter. And so we cannot overlook why that generation did not enter and expect to enter. Because the enter is not time bound, it's principle bound. The prophecy of this is time bound and I can tell you the time is now. Yes sir. Hey, for you will arise and favor Zion. For the time to favor her. Yay! The set time is now. I wish I was teaching someone or two. I'll have shown you why it was Zion there. I was actually speaking about the city of the living God. I don't talk about your personal things. Psalm 102. Psalm 102 was a scripture of the groan. It showed how man was supposed to groan because of the failure of the natural body. Then he entered right in the center and said, You will arise and favor Zion. Are you still here? So, because they fell out, the promise remains because God's word cannot fail. And those of us who have come to inherit the promise, now don't please forgive me, I've not spoken about the promises. My next session will be the promises. So that let's mark out the New Testament promises that the finishing line generation must embrace on behalf of every generation that ran before it. Are you alive? Come on, come on, saints. Are you alive? Great. Let us therefore fear the warning. Lest the promise be left us of entering to his rest. What? Any of you should seem to come short of. Please, thank you, sir. Please sit down. Uh, go back to Hebrews chapter 3. Go back to Hebrews 3. Where did we stop? Wherefore I was grieved with that generation. Hebrews 3, verse 10 now. When your fathers tempted me, proved me, some I walked 40 years with that generation. Wherefore I was grieved with that generation and said, they do always err, where? In their heart, and they have not known my ways. Next verse. So what is the outcome? So I swear in my wrath, they shall not enter into my rest. Next verse, verse 12. 12 now. The warning. Take heed, brethren. Uh -huh. An evil heart of... Can you see how they erred in their heart? So the erred in their heart was not that they didn't like God. It was that they were unbelieving. Let me say something I've said, I think I've said across our churches. It was 40 days, 40 days that God invited Moses on top of the mountain. Pastor Tony, in 40 days, 40 days was long enough for them to determine that Moses was dead. 40 days was long enough for them to determine that now that Moses is dead, God is dead too. Long enough for them to determine that now that Moses and God is dead, they need a new God. Long enough for them to determine that for them to get a new God, they need to use the priest of the former God. Long enough for them to determine that that priest of the former God must make them a God out of gold and silver. So you see what was always exalted in their hearts. Don't play with tradition. Don't play with tradition. I explained tradition in church last Sunday and I said to them very clearly, tradition is not those things they obey in your village. Tradition is anything man has done consistently and has accepted to be ID. The moment it is accepted among men to be ID, this is what Jesus said. Jesus said, you have made the word of God of non-effect 
because of your traditions. That means this word of God that is sharper than any double-edged sword. This word of God that is heavier than a hammer that breaks a rock into pieces. This word of God that shall not return to God void is made void by tradition. That means all the power of the word of God becomes nothing the moment you miss tradition. So tradition for Israel was that in Egypt, listen to this, they saw the Egyptians, the Egyptians with gold and silver. And how they knew they were slaves was that they lacked gold and silver. The moment God was taken away from them, the first thing they went for was what they believed they lacked. Now, that they lacked it meant that Listen, the absence of it is not the lack of it. You can not have a thing and not lack it. Do you understand it? What makes it lack is the longing of your soul to have it. Ooh. My soul belongs. My soul belongs. My soul. My soul belongs to the Lord. My soul belongs. My soul belongs. My soul. My soul belongs to the Lord. My soul belongs. My soul belongs. My soul. My soul belongs to the Lord. Don't play with the things that stand in front of your eyes and make you feel like without them you cannot live. In fact, rebel against them. Defy them. Anything that takes that kind of place in your heart that makes you feel like if you don't have me, you are not complete. That's why God recommended giving. Because you will not serve God and mammon. God knows that the tradition of the earth has exalted mammon. And every time God is confronted in the mind of a man, the first thing he refers to is money. That's why when you lack it, you feel incomplete. So God recommends that when he makes you feel incomplete, give it all. You remember the story of the rich young ruler, right? Now that's why God recommends giving. God recommends giving as a display that mammon does not have dominion over me. That's why people have paid their tithes for 20 years but still struggle. You don't understand what I'm saying. Still struggle. And I don't mean they are struggling in life. They are still struggling to pay the tithe. People, Pastor Iko, people pay their tithes for 20 years. And after 20 years, you would think that they would have gained mastery enough to consider the type nothing. That's how powerful a strange God is. And the strength of a strange God is not the power of his altar. It's the strength of tradition. It's that men traditionally have arrived at believing. We cannot live without this. And the moment they arrive there, every time the word of the Lord rises in their heart, let that word of the Lord, if he knows what is good for it, avoid the matters of mammon. Because once it comes around the matters of mammon, the word of God is made of non-effect. By that tradition. In the context in which Jesus spoke, spoke it, he was speaking to the Pharisees and how that they had conjured the laws of Moses to favor the things that are good to them. He said, scripture said you must honor your father and your mother. He said, but you have said, if a man shall say, Koban. That means the person that is supposed to be for the honor of your father or your mother. If you stand and you lift it up and you say, I'm going to give it to God. Then you are free from honor your father and your mother. The reason is because I'm going to give it to God. Ends up with the priests. Thank you. That means God 
does not expect to collect the money you are supposed to use to take care of your mother. I'm talking to somebody right now. In fact, it is within that context that the Bible says that if you cannot take care of your old mother, you are you have denied the faith and you are worse than an infidel. That means it is an integral part of your worship to take care of your parents. Are you me? Don't vow the money that is supposed to take care of your parents. Don't vow it. Don't vow it in church. Okay. I'm sorry on their behalf. Their behalf can solve for themselves. Tradition. Aye. Is anybody understanding me? When the word meets tradition, the Bible says it becomes void. Now, oh, please take us back to Hebrews chapter 3. Hebrews 3. It said, Wherefore I was grieved with that generation. And so I swore in my anger, one, that they shall not enter into my rest. Please go to Hebrews chapter 4 now. Verse 6. 4 6. We had read all of this. So, 6. Seeing therefore, it remains that what? Some must enter. Somebody say, must enter. That means this one, Pastor Wisdom, this one is not our determination. God has sworn some must enter. Ooh, I wish you heard it. That means there is no way the earth will finish. And some have not entered. Listen, if you came for finishing line, then you must brace up your heart to start to find the promises of this better covenant and decide that it is in your life to be fulfilled. Because let me tell you, part of the marks of a finishing line generation is determination. We know that it's not by power, it's not by might. But let it not be said that God is looking for a man and he did not find a willing man. So if my contribution is willingness, I give it. Let it be God's failure that I did not arrive, not mine. Oh, you did not hear me. Yes, sir. But can God fail? No. Yes, sir. That means as solely as God is God, if he finds a ready people, he will have to fulfill this. And some must enter therein. Then the Bible went on to say, and they to whom it was first spoken, entered not in because of unbelief. So, see, we need to arrive. What is this unbelief? Because we have to define it now. Abi, next verse. Again, he limited a day in David saying today. Kai. What did he say in David? Today, if you will, here's words. There are two scriptures I wish I could go through. How did he limit it in David? What was the posture of heart? First things first. Please find this message. I cannot, I cannot take the time to finish this. Alright? In Psalm 132, we saw when David swore that counseled the swearing of God. God swore in his anger, they will not enter my rest. David swore in his determination, I will not rest until he rests. Give him Psalm 132. So, uh, give him from us one. Psalm 1 and 2 from verse 1. You need to take note of it. Listen. And these guys are men of like person like us we are. You see, that's the reason why that redeemer, that groaning is absolutely necessary. Because it is amazing that God will not do anything on the earth except in response to man. So if the groan is not complete, I beg you, if, okay, those of you who didn't get that message, I don't know how Pastor A is going to do it, but Pastor, hey, you guys work out a modality. Everyone who came for camp should get that message, that Redeemer message that I preached. So we don't have to go by it. There's so much in my spirit to teach in this camp. Listen, 
Lord, remember David in all his afflictions. That it was not convenience that made David say what he said. But Lord, remember David and all his afflictions. How he did what? He swore unto the Lord and vowed unto the mighty one of Jacob. What was his vow? Verse 3. Surely I will not come into the tabernacle of my house nor go up into my bed. You don't understand it. So after David built his palace, David refused to sleep in his room. That's why when David wrote to Solomon and he said, except the Lord builds a house, he wasn't just talking about the building of a physical house. Because that letter was David to Solomon. Those of you who've been around me, have heard me teach a lot recently. It was a letter from David to Solomon. And he told Solomon, except the Lord builds the house. They build in vain that build it. Then except the Lord watches over a city. That means this palace is useless to me, Lord. Except I see you rest. Now God swore to the same Israel in the wilderness. They shall not enter my rest. Now don't forget what I come from Hebrews chapter 4. He said, and he spared a day in David saying today. I'm going to take you to where he spared a day in David saying today. To show you the unbelief of that generation. But the first thing you must see about David was that David was a man who would swear against the swearing of God. Now you see, hey, this is the second person we're talking about in this regard. First, we spoke about Abraham. God said, This is the land. Abraham said, He said, This cannot be the land. No, it's God that spoke. And all faith is premised on the word of God. And the God of faith said to a man, This is the land. The man said to the God of faith, this cannot be the land. He was like, what's the difference between this and all? He would have left us in Haran. We're not doing badly in Haran. That's one of the reasons why, see thou thy calling, brethren, not many noble. The reason is because the noble find it difficult to divorce the lands they are coming from. But God found a noble Abraham. Abraham left nobility to answer God. That's to tell you that there was something all oh, eternity is planted in the heart of man. There was something in his heart that knew that all of this comfort cannot answer to the depth of the quest that was put inside of me. And David will not rest. So David said to himself, we are trying to see the David in whom God spared another day. That means from the day God swore Dr. Faith and said, they shall not enter into my rest. God didn't ever refer to the matter of rest until David came. So what we want to check is, why? what did David have that triggered back the subject of rest? One was that David said, I have a groan. I will not let my groan enter into a resting place so that I don't throw away my groaning by my comfort. Mm. I wish you heard me. I will not go up into the sanctuary of my bed. Why? Because if I go into the sanctuary of my bed and I start to get used to sleeping, where? Yeah. I will soon forget that the Lord seeks rest. That he gave me rest only as a token to remind me that he has still not rested in Israel. Surely I will not come into the tabernacle of my house, nor go up into my bed. Aye, my God. See, when you hear that David had mighty men, don't it's not it's not it's not casual. Sir, it's not casual. Did you see Uriah? Valley? Do you 
kills you. So you understand why a man will not go to the comfort of his bed. They had said to David, you cannot go to war with us anymore. You are the light of Israel. It's obvious that it's the covenant of God with you that we have tried upon. So don't war. Sit at home. The complacency of sitting at home made David look at the wife of Uriah. Come for me. And he looked at her lustfully and slept with her. That was not the problem. The problem was that the custom of not going up into his bed was not only David's custom. You will soon see that this rest cannot be attained by a man. It has to be attained by a generation. So the honor for God's cause was not only David's honor. David had forgotten in the day of his complacency. Then he sent a word to Joah and said, send me Uriah. They sent Uriah. Listen, he came to Uriah and said, ah, how's war? That I just thought about you and I said, you know, you have done us great in Israel. So please go home and rest for a time, for some time. Uriah said, okay, you didn't teach us like that. Ah, this must be a test. And he didn't say despising David. Oh, may God give us sons that will call us back to order. He didn't say it despising David. Sir, you taught us better. Say, sir, people are my, my comrades at war. I can't go. They will say, ah, no, no, no. no it's, it's, you are, this is presidential pardon. We are, we are give you an apostolic instruction. You need to go home and rest. Uriah says, sir, that's going to be difficult. David said, give me the strongest wine. They gave him wine. Pastor Judith, I'm not, see, Uriah was drunk, but in the drunkness of his drunk, the pleasure of being at home with his wife was not the first thought that came out of his heart to his head. In the drunkest state of Uriah. Uriah didn't sleep in his house. Uriah's house, you would know that the custom was that the generals of David built their houses around the house of David. Declaring that for you to touch David, you must come through us. That's what set Uriah in trouble. That's why David could stand on his roof and look into Uriah's house. There were men who decided they were going to be vulnerable to David. What's shocking, sir, is that the Bible didn't say Uriah slept at the doorpost of his house. No. His house was in the neighborhood, possibly steps away. Uriah came out and he let, lay down at the steps of the gate of the palace. David realized that the culture of exalting the kingdom was not my culture. The only way you beat tradition is with tradition. Just like the only way you subdue law is law. For the law of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus has made me free from the law of sin. You cannot think your way out of the law of sin and death. A new law has to be at work in your members. And a law is compelling. A law is almost automatic. It's like gravity. When thing goes up, it's coming down. It's a law. And you soon see that your righteousness was designed to be a law. Look at Uriah. So you realize that the David that taught them he was the one they first saw it from. But Uriah slept at the door of the king's house with all the servants of his lord. It's may God. He decided as surely as there's a cause on the fields. I will deny myself the comfort. I spoke about Uriah only so that you see that David became a law, he became a custom 
David became a tradition. The people who were around David learned the traditions of David. See that one? Uh, take me back to Psalm 132. 132. Surely, I'll not come into the tabernacle of my house nor go up into my bed. Next verse. I will not give sleep to my eyes nor slumber to my eyelids. Next verse. No, no, no. Please try, try reading it again. One, two, three, go. Ah? Huh? Listen. Until I find a place, it's not until I build a place. David was not talking about let's build a place so that the ark of God can see. What he was saying is, I want to find out the customs of God. He's going forth and he's returning. So that if we're going to keep him somewhere, we will keep him in a place. Oh, that's why I will restore again the tabernacle of David, which has been broken down. When he said it in Amos, God was not joking. That's why David could set a tabernacle that defied the order of Moses and God did not. The reason was because David did not study Moses. He found a place. He sought who the Lord was and what the Lord's customs were. He knew that it was the Lord's great delight to meet with his people. He knew that it was not the Lord's design for his people to be caught away from him. He knew that it is that anger that made that God caused a separation between him and the people. And of course, it was, it was proven at Calvary. The moment the Lord Jesus said, it is finished. The veil tore. God made his way to man. Almost like God could not wait. David found it. Judith. He found it. Can I throw you a question? What have you found? I'm not saying this insultively. Listen, I'm saying it to rest a burden on your shoulder. Some of you, even when you are taught, you don't find. Not to talk about a man who set out on his own and decided, I must find it. Please give back that scripture. And finish it quickly. I have one more psalm to deal with this morning. Just so that we can set a foundation for the finishing line. There has to be a generation that will say to themselves, I can't give my eyes sleep. If God has been building something since Abel, if God has been building something since Abraham, my eye will not sleep until I know the something and know my contribution in the something. The time for haphazard living is gone. Until I find out a place for the Lord and habitation for the mighty God of Jacob. Next verse. Lo, we heard of it at Ephrata. We found it in the fields of the woods. Do you, can you see that I told you David found it? What did he hear of? He heard of the ways of God. Where do we find it? You know what David was saying? Magdalene, do you know? Do you know what he was saying? What he was saying was that as I escaped from Saul and went through the wildernesses of life, if I can turn back and give proper attention to the pathway God used to bring me here, I will see who he is. Many people don't find God because they don't have record of where they left him. Where they left him is not where you walked away from God and stopped serving him. What I'm saying is that God is leaving signs upon the tracks of your life daily. But you are not taking account and magnifying those signs. So that in the day when you want to aggregate who God is, you are not supposed to go somewhere. If you turn around and you see the journey, he has journeyed with you. Listen, if you don't know that the hand of the Lord is upon you, it's because you have not turned back. Turn back to the woods 
that life drove you through and the witnesses that God gave you consistently and the places where his altar was established in your life and the number of times he delivered you you will know that he must be interested in doing something with you to do the kind of things that he has done for you my wife is here she knows Rebo, I live every day knowing that I'm a vital part of something God is building sometimes even when I don't know this something I just feel I feel the expectation of creation I feel the expectation of heavenly witness I feel the expectation of divinity. So when you read Hebrews chapter 12, and you are reading, you have come unto Mount Zion, to the city of the living God. While you are thinking, you are counting assembly, I am seeing the witnesses whose hope is at the back of my head. I told my wife, when I was growing up, Pijud, when I was growing up, there are certain days I get up, and I'm feeling like everything is happening on the earth because of me. That if I leave a place, everything freezes. Like everything is freezing, waiting for me to finish what I'm doing. Then when I return, then things will continue. It didn't only come by divine choice. It came by meditation. Lord, what are you doing on the earth? What's my place in it? How will I... How do you convince a John the Baptist that his life is a failure? And the angel of the Lord said, and he shall be great. And greatness for John the Baptist, in natural sense, was camel skin. And locust. And wild honey. Do you think Elizabeth will have gone around telling her friends, my son is very successful? Especially when his ministry was not shaking kings. Because ultimately in that camel skin, he began to speak and Herod heard. To the extent that when Herod first heard about Jesus, he said, I've killed John the Baptist. Who is this one? He said, this must be John. He must have risen again from the dead. That means that in the spirit, even the demons that sat on Herod knew that Jesus was operating after the order that John had said. Spiritual things have an order. You are a priest forever in the order of Melchizedek. Find the order of your lineage. Hold it there. Find the order of your lineage. Hold it there. How you know is that your relationship with God will be thriving. You will start to account for the seasons of your life. Listen, if you are chosen for this assignment, you will wake up and you will realize, hey, no, I cannot live every day like every other day. There's a demand of heaven. Almost everyone who lives like that is careful about birthdays. You know why? Birthdays are not jubilations for us. We are thinking one year less. Why everybody is gathering and they are celebrating the faithfulness of God? We are thinking that's one year less in the number of years assigned for me to do the things. That's one year less. If the Lord Jesus is coming, that's one year less. By the time we are done with this camp meeting, and you have seen the principles and prophecies and promises that you must fulfill before the Lord Jesus returns. Every time it's your birthday, you'll be saying, this is one year less. Which of those principles have now been completed? Which of those prophecies have now come to pass? Which of those promises am I beginning to apprehend? It keeps you in a consistently mournful state. I'm not talking about a morning unto depression. I'm talking about an inner deep reflection that makes that you can account for every season of your life because you'll find that it is vital. Lo, we heard of it in Ephrata. We found it in the fields of the wood. Next verse, verse 7. What did he say? We will go into his life. Now you see that it was not a house that David built that pleased God. It was finding the ways of God. What did David say? We will go into his tabernacle and we will do what? Worship 
at his footstool please hold this verse i will come back to it now because it's the absence of this that makes god reject a generation in the promise of rest was eight arise oh lord into thy rest thou and the ark of your strength next verse let your priests be clothed with righteousness and let your saints You see, the garment of the priest was not supposed to be an effort. It was supposed to be righteousness. And that righteousness is not just right living. It is the fact that the Lord, their God himself, is clothed in righteousness. That means the priest was supposed to put on God. That putting on of God is the rest yes sir because Isaiah 66 tells you very clearly to where is the place of my habitation where is the place of rest that you made for me he said all these physical buildings my hand made them meaning if this was what I was looking for he won't, I won't have waited for you. He said, but to this man will I look. Give me that 62. For all those things that my hand made, and all those things have been, said the Lord. But to this man will I look. Even to him who is poor and of a contrite spirit that does what? That means God is looking for the man who is on pilgrimage. Poverty in the spirit is pilgrimage. The knowledge that you do not know enough to represent God sufficiently. That it is registered behind the back of your mind. I don't know. That's the reason why I fear a generation that seems to glory in their display of knowledge. Because what God is requiring from a generation is a poverty. So that everything they seem to know becomes an invitation into more. Except if it's not the same God. By the grace of God, God has blessed me tremendously. When it comes to the knowledge of scripture, I don't even need to say that in front of you. God has blessed me tremendously. But I find out, Pastor Adam, that the more I know him, the more I realize that the elements of him are deeper than what I've come to find. So how you know it was God you found was that your hunger becomes deeper. There's no day you become complacent. My wife is here. You can ask her. I lie down in the night. It's scriptures. I'm raising them up. And I'm thinking, Lord, what, I, what exactly are you saying here? What are you working? How does this add to you? People read their scriptures like, like religious tradition. I don't. I don't. When I sit down to read scriptures, what I'm actually trying to apprehend is, Lord, what are you working on the earth? And what do I do to become a part of it? Because it is not the finishing line until we speak about what manner of men and what manner of time. Because we have to establish, is this the time? If this is the time, then what manner of men ought we to be? this man will I look so take us back to Psalm 2 look at this so he said your priests will be clothed with righteousness and your saints will serve with us stop listen what is ordained for all the saints is the revelation of the glory and the dominion of God of the systems and the seasons of the earth enough to subdue the seasons and systems of the earth in obedience to God 
this honor have all the saints of God? What honor? To bind their kings with chains, their nobles with fetters of iron. If you find the things that scripture says, the honor of all the saints, every single time, you will find out that the honor of all the saints is to release, as it were, the revelation of the subduing power of God in this realm. David said, I found it. If I can wear God and display him, God will rest. Ah. David said, I found it. If I can wear God and display him. Genesis chapter 2 verse 2. Genesis 2 2. And on the seventh day, God ended one his work which he had made, and God rested. Come again. That's chapter 2, verse 2. And on the seventh day, God ended, and God rested. What made God rest? Genesis chapter 1, verse 26. Let us make man in our image and after our likeness and let them have dominion over the fish of the sea, the birds of the air, and over every living thing and everything that creepeth upon the face of the earth. So God made created man in his own image, in the image of God created he, him, male and female created he, them, verse 28, and God blessed them and said, be fruitful, multiply, fill the earth, subdue it, replenish the earth, take dominion over the fish of the sea, the birds of the air, over every living thing that liveth and creepeth. Verse 29. And God said, Behold, I have given you every half bearing field, every half bearing seed which is upon the face of the earth, and every tree in the which the fruit of a tree yielding seed, and to you it will be for meat. Next verse. And to every beast of the earth, to every fowl of the air, to everything that creepeth upon the earth, wherein there is life, I have given every green herb for meat. And it was so. Next verse. Next verse. And God saw everything he had made. And behold, it was. Let me tell you the difference between God's good and God's very good. Everything he made was good. It was orderly. When he made man, it was good until he gave man control of everything. Then God says, when man is in control of everything, very good. Why? Because now that man is in control of everything, I can rest. So the rest of God is the recreation of the man who will do everything God will do the way God would have done it. Do you understand me? So when David said, I found it. What David was saying. Ooh. I see. God wants to clothe my priesthood. With himself. And release my kingship in authority over the earth. In the day when God sees me like that. God goes. So, what we came to seek is, Lord, what does it take for you? I've been a leader. God has, God has blessed me. I started to lead things very early in my life. And I realized that one of the criticisms that we suffer as leaders, Pastor Jude, is everybody believes we love control. You and the them pastors, so you know what I'm talking about. Everybody believes we love control. What people don't know is that there's what we see 
And we feel deficient in the communication of what we see. And we truly hope somewhere in our hearts that the people who are committed to us will see what we see. And our heart breaks every time when we attempt to express and it becomes evident that the people are not as committed to what we see as we are committed to what we see. And the moment we get there more, we would rather work our salvation with our own arms. I wish you heard me in the spirit. Ah, uh, do you now understand when scripture says, and God sought a man. And when he found not a man, Pastor Ben, the Bible says his own arm brought him salvation. That means through the ages, he was looking for a man who can see what he sees. And it is seen in the commitment and the response of that man to the things that divide. So you hear Paul say things like, no man is concerned about the things of the Lord. Every man is concerned about his own things. That he almost sounds like a lie. He was frustrated. But Paul had companions now. People like Timothy gave up their lives and went to establish the church in Ephesus. How will Paul tell us no man is concerned about the things of the law? It's the frustration of the accuracy of the representation of what you see. And I hope you know that in Genesis chapter 1 verse 1, in the beginning there was in the barasheet, in the head of God. So the picture you see in Genesis chapter 1 was the vision of God. And from the day God spoke his vision, he's been waiting to see one man who will live entirely to birth his vision. David said, I found it. I see that God is frustrated. His frustration is he's looking for a man who will wear him on and will live for nothing less than the vision in the heart of God. Because if a man can live like that, listen, that I am doing the will of God or doing something that God showed me is not even sufficient for my heart to rest. Because sometimes, even when I'm in obedience to God's instruction, more, I'm saying to myself, is this the capacity at which God will have done this thing? If he was here would he be speaking to the blind and the blindness will continue then i know that even though i came here by the word of the lord there are still depths in god i need to unearth because god cannot rest even if i do his work at less than his capacity yes sir yes sir that means it is not only the works of god it is also the capacity of god so God said, when I see a man wearing me, and the only time God saw it was when Jesus walked the face of the earth. God said, yes, that's it. That's it. That's it. But like I said to those of you who listened to me in the last few weeks, dominion was, was not commanded upon him, Jesus. Dominion was commanded upon them. Christ and his church. That means until the church arises to his stature. And I took the time in that message to say, the Bible says, wherefore he's not ashamed to call them brethren. Then he wrote out three scriptures that explain what it means for him not to be ashamed. Which church did I preach at? Zaria, right? Find it. Not ashamed to call them brethren. He said, I'll put my trust in him. How does that sound like he's not ashamed to call them brethren? Meaning, the same Holy Spirit that perfected him was the same Holy Spirit he released to his church. And so he said to himself, Even if the church looks scattered and nonsensical right now, I will trust that spirit. That that same spirit that raised me up from the dead, that spirit will quicken them. Yeah. Same spirit. Yeah. Same spirit. So Psalm 132. 
David said, Arise, come to your rest. Take us back to verse 7, and I will show you what the people in the wilderness missed. 7. David said, We will go into his tabernacles and we will worship at his footstool. What Israel lacked in the wilderness was the knowledge of God's ways. You remember? Right? And the error of their hearts. You remember that? And the pathway to knowing the ways of God is to worship at his feet. So what Israel, listen to this, and this is very, for me, this is very crucial. Very crucial. Maybe it might sound simple to you, but very crucial. Pastor David, Israel had, had by tradition, learned to worship, to justify their conscience, but not to know God. By tradition, they had learned to worship. Listen to this. To satisfy their conscience. I've said a lot in the recent times. Your conscience is not God. The Bible tells you clearly that your conscience is greater. God is greater than your conscience. But God, in the order of worship as set by Paul in Romans 6 and 7, he warned that nobody should be permitted to do a thing when, it's, when it defiles his conscience. The reason is because, listen to this very carefully because this is going to help you. The reason is because if it comes outside of conscience, it is outside of faith. And if it's outside of faith, it is sin. That means even if it is acceptable to God that the man did not do it freely of a free conscience, God does not accept it as worship right when i get to this kind of speaking tradition helps me easier traditionally if you go to the traditional the traditional churches in the north well traditional churches all, all over nigeria you know that a woman cannot enter into church without her head covered right and it is an extrapolation of scripture and possibly a not very accurate interpretation of that scripture let's not get into the arguments of that but you will now find that those of us who seem to have advanced in knowledge can free our hair and worship. Now, if you find somebody who is coming from that traditional context, I will always say it in the God Life Assembly that my encouragement is if what it takes for you to worship is tie your hair tight. Don't mind all of us sinners whose head are open. That you walk in here and find an atmosphere of God and you enjoy to worship and you enjoy to do it with your head tied, tie your hair. Now, why? The reason is because it is not acceptable worship if your conscience is defined. Do you understand me? But the drive of every true believer is to make sure that the boundary lines of his conscience is accurate with the boundary lines of the knowledge of God. So that in my conscience boundary line is here. It means that there are the liberties of God from here to here I will never enjoy. And it's not, liberty is not just enjoy as, as in enjoy. It means that any assignment God wants to give that requires the knowledge of God within here and here, he will not give me. Even if it is written in his books for me to do, he will not give me. That's why the salvation of the Gentiles was taken away from Peter. And give me to Paul. This is the reason why. If the boundary of my conscience is here, and God's word is here, it means that every time Satan wants to get me, what he does is he opens up dimensions of lust and licentiousness that I feel justified in because I forced the scripture to say what he did not say. That means that the assignment, and that one nobody can do for you. Because even if your pastor teaches well, you have to choose the church. I wish you heard me. 
I mean, even if your pastor is teaching truth, you have to choose the church. And after you have chosen the church, that's if you didn't choose the church for other reasons. After you have chosen the church, I hope you know that the licentiousness in your heart will still be arguing when your pastor is teaching. So this assignment you must do for yourself. That means my assignment every day, see, is to see that the boundary line of my conscience is seated exactly upon the accurate knowledge of God and God's word. Is it possible? Yes, it is. Are you following? Please let me go through one through this one more time. So I told you. They erred because of a wrong state of heart and the absence of the knowledge of his ways. Have you followed so far? Come on, have you followed so far? It's just a few two hours. You should be you should still be all right. And it's even the first two hours of the entire conference. So we cannot not be saying amen right now. Aha. Uh-huh. Yes, 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 yes. Layers of truth. They have come, right? Aha, uh-huh. yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, 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 my guys, my guys, my guys. There, there you don't lack an amen. <laughs> yeah, some of them are not there. That's all right. You don't know. So, okay, you are welcome, eh? The last time I was with them, we had, how long did we teach? Two hours, two and a half hours. And I told them, let me close now. They shouted, no! Eh? As I said, these mad children. And half of the time they were standing. Very exciting people to teach. And ooh, if you teach them, you know you are called. <laughs> and yet they know how to catch anybody that teaches rubbish. E, you can't teach them. E, leave it. I didn't come to discuss layers of truth. Let me continue on scripture. Good to see you guys. Amen. All right. Now, why do we stop? Why do you like? Right? So it is the personal assignment of every believer to make sure that the boundary line of their conscience is exact with the boundary line of the word of God. Okay, good. So I returned and I said to you, the Bible tells you that they erred because they did not know God. Nada. They, they, sorry. And they did not know his ways. Come on, come on, come on now. All right. So they end their hearts and they do not know his ways. So David said, we will go to his tabernacles and we will worship at his footstool. Why? You remember that scripture said today, if you will hear his voice, had it not your heart. Did I tell you something about tradition today? Now, that means that the word of God came to them, but the word of God was made of because of their... So the hardening of their hearts were the traditions that confronted the word of God, daddy. As the traditions confronted the word of God, they would rather stick with their tradition than change position in their hearts. So they are. But the Bible now revealed to us why they had that problem. Right? Why? I told you that David said we will go to his tabernacles and we will worship as it, at his footstool. So when scripture said in Hebrews chapter 4, today if you hear my voice, Hebrews chapter 3, today if you hear my voice, he was actually quoting something David said is in Psalm 95. So let's close this morning session on Psalm 95. Let us see the place where God finally changed his mind. Whew. Are you there? Psalm 95 from verse 1. Let's worship him. Lay our lives down at his feet. Oh. 
Let's worship Tell him that he's all that we need Jesus we thank you We lift our hearts in praise Cause it's you we love It's you we worship Oh, we worship your feet we worship declaring that you're all that we need oh Jesus we thank you we verse 8 let's read what we are familiar with first it said oh start from verse 7 for he is our God we are the people of his pasture and the sheep of his hand this is where I want to start today if you will hear his voice next verse Harden not your heart as is in the provocation and is in the day of temptation in the wilderness. Does that sound familiar? Exactly the way we read it, right? When your fathers tempted me, proved me, and saw my work, for 40 years long was I grieved with this generation and said, and have not known my ways. Uh Uh-huh. Unto whom... I swear in my anger that that means if we read Psalm 95 we will see as it were what should be the antidote to this because the Bible told you where we are coming from in Hebrews chapter 4 that he spared another day in David saying today that means the day he spared is here In the order of response to the covenant of God, let me say this very quickly. I thought I was going to have a full session to, to teach this. It's obvious I cannot get it. In the order of covenant response to God, hear this very carefully. From creation to sonship, from sonship to servanthood, from servanthood to friendship, from friendship to brideship. That's the progression of the order of covenant with God. So you know that a man is entering to covenant with God when these things are in succession. Yes, sir. As I again, yes, sir. it comes from creation. God has a covenant with creation. It's in Isaiah chapter 40. In, a, in, in the covenant of God with creation, listen to this. In the covenant of God with creation, all things are sustained by the word that released them from the very beginning. And is sustained in the principle called seed. That's why what God said to Noah was not a covenant with his church. It was a re-covenant with creation. God was reenacting what he said to Adam when he was speaking to Noah. When he said, as long as the earth remains, that's not a believer's covenant. That covenant is for the earth. It's for creation. 
So you find that in God's order of creation, everything is created in circles. Or created in seeds. So that everything God created does not need God to sustain it. Are you following me? And God in creation decided independence as a display of his power. Why are you? So that anything that chooses to worship him made a voluntary turn to return and give thanks. The one thing he displayed in the healing of the ten lepers. When the nine walked away and the tenth one remembered. Uh, uh, that's the priest. Are, are you following me? Because the priest was not the one in the temple. If the priest was the one in the temple, it would be the priest that would be responsible for cleansing. While they went to present themselves to the priest, God honored their faith to go at the word of the Lord and heal their bodies. But only one remembered that if there's a priest, he must be the one who spoke to us. Yeah. Do you understand it? That's why it takes faith to please God. That's why you cannot even obey instructions mindlessly. You have to know God. You have to arrive at knowing God. Don't forget, many generations laid their lives down for this thing. Many generations lived with circumcision. They lived with a knife to their throats. Many generations did. And they did only so that we can come and finish. We cannot fail the hope of many generations. If you have been hearing me since morning, the whole of the book of Hebrews will have come together in your eyes. Now, understand it. What was I going to talk about, Fali? Covenant. So the first level of covenant, and every man must progress through this. In the revelations of the fact that you are beginning to understand the covenant of God. You remember? He said, a new covenant will I make with them. Not according to the covenant that I made with their fathers in the wilderness. When I took them by the hand and led them out of the land of Egypt. He said, but this is the covenant that I will make with them in that day. I will write my law upon their hearts. And I will write it. Uh, so no man will need to teach his neighbor saying, know the Lord. They will all know me. Now, I'm not speaking about the manner of covenant. I'm speaking about the progression in the understanding of covenant. The first covenant, every man and every created man has the covenant of creation with God. Every created man, not every born again man. The next covenant of God is sonship. And by sonship, I'm not speaking about full stature. Because the full stature of sonship in scripture is called adoption. Sonship here is speaking about the fact that you are now born again. In fact, the Lord Jesus said in John chapter 3 that that's what qualifies you to see the kingdom of God or gain the earliest understandings of who God is and what he's building. That's sonship. I hope I, I laid the disclaimer properly. This is not the fullness of sons. Like uh, the heir, as long as he remains a child, if I have nothing. No, that's not that distinction. Because... Adoption is actually beyond that dis that distinction that you make. Beloved, now we the sons of God, but it does not yet appear what we shall be like. That means it's something beyond sonship. What is beyond sonship according to Romans chapter 8 and 7 Corinthians chapter 5 is the adoption. The full stature of sonship is adoption. So the same covenant is sonship. It's at that point that the man becomes born again. But that the man becomes born again does not mean that the man has arrived a born again man still has choices has choices as to how far he wants to go with god the next thing that happens when a man is born again according to malachi chapter 3 is that he becomes a son that serves so the next dimension is service and in service the son can of himself do nothing it is what he sees the father doing the son who has arrived at serving will not contend with the father he doesn't hold on to his rights he lets them go at that point, he becomes what is called a born servant. And a born servant knows that the goodness of his master makes that his service to his master is in his best interest at arriving at the best that he can ever be. That his best as a servant in his master's house, he will never be able to find up to that if he's been given his independence. That's what the father of the prodigal son knew.
one of the things I came to this conference with is I chin talk a born servant of the Lord Jesus. So I decided like two months ago, I'm going to wear prisoner's clothes throughout this conference. You like this prisoner's clothes, right? That's actually how prisoners dress. Born servants. They carry pockets because of work. Born servants. Some of us are very deliberate. Listen. Beyond servanthood is what? Friendship. At servanthood, you are obedient. In friendship, you begin to become a covenant partaker. John 15, 15. I no longer call you servants. Because the servant does not know what his master is doing. That means they just tell him what to do and he faithfully obeys. He said, but friends, they are into, they have a foreknowledge. That means they are part of discussion that decides what happens. I hope you took note that it takes servanthood to arrive at friendship. Do you understand it? That means you don't arrive at serving God and asking why. You start by serving God without the wise, you will soon be around the table that determines the why. Ah. Are you sure you heard me? You start serving God without asking why. You remember that what we are trying to find out is today if you hear his voice. Harden not your heart. Why? Because my sheep, they know my voice. Uh, so you, you can understand that today if you will hear his voice, it's not for anybody. It starts with people who are determined to be servants. At the point of service, you lose all your rights. That's why Malachi chapter 3 said, and I will spare him like a man spared his son that serves him. That means he takes sonship to become a servant within that context. That means this servanthood is not, oh, we are servants of God, we are not sons of God. No. This is the servanthood that comes upon the premise of the fact that we are sons of God. That means in this kingdom, you know your right as son first. That your journey starts from knowing my right as a son. And seeking my right as a son. Lord, bless me. You don't, Lord, bless me. I know what you want to say, though. <laughs> You sail from there into service. Then when you break the curtain of service, you find friendship. It's at that point that you start to hear things like, shall we do this thing without revealing it to our friend Abraham? Abraham had no contribution in what they were going to do. God and Abraham were just this thing. So a point comes. When you and God can be taking counsel around the table. There are few people who made it. In the Old Testament, people made it to friendship. Moses was one of them. Moses arrived at the place where Moses could say to God, He <laughs> said, Lord, okay, Lord. So now, now that you are planning to kill these people now, what? So all this Og, king of Bashan, all this. What, what do you want them to be thinking, sir? So that they will now say that you took them out of Egypt and you could not sustain them. Then you now kill them in the wilderness like an easy escape. The Bible says, God. So, Kai, Moses is true. Can you see progression in covenant dimensions? Before God permits you friendship, you must have understood his ways enough by serving him. What did I tell you earlier? I said we found it where in the woods if you turn back and see the pathway he drove you through if you can aggregate it you will know him if you can aggregate the pathway you have walked you will know him god has always been with you you have just been careless. You are not taking record. He's always been with you. Oh, know the days when you need to take up the archives of the things that God has done. And set before your eyes. Go and check it. Every time you felt useless, Satan had to close your eyes to the things that you are coming from. 
the track record of God. I told you this, but one line has been troubling me in a song for weeks now. You have a track record of keeping your word. You're not about to stop doing. Is that's the line? That's the line. Everyone under the sound of my voice has sufficient record of the faithfulness of God. You have it. The reason why you are still stumbling is that Satan is not permitting you to aggregate the journey that you have made in God. If you aggregate it, you will look at that devil in the eye and tell him he's a liar because the hand of the Lord is upon you. It is that hand that has brought you thus far. It is that hand that is at work in your life. It is that hand that will take you where God has it. That hand of the Lord, the good hand of God is upon us. The man said the people were stayed up and we worked because the good hand of God was upon us. The good hand of God is on us. The good hand of God is on us. The good hand of God is on us. The number of things that have caused you pain are nothing to be compared with the kind of things that God has left in your past. There's sufficient witness, sufficient testimony on your part. If you aggregate it, you will know God. If you aggregate it, you will know God. There is nothing you cannot do. There's no mountain you cannot. If you have said it, then you will do it. You have a track record of keeping your word. And you're not about to stop. There's no mountain you cannot move. If you have said it, you will do it. Say, if you have said it, you will do it. If you have said it, you will do it. Say, if you have said it, you will do it. Say, if you
Sokas, ye para sa bote ki para kala, ye rata pa so ke de apa sala, ye rata pa ra ka kala, ye vale ba ra. First creation, then sonship, sonship, servanthood, servanthood, friendship. At the level of friendship, you now arrive at the place where you and God have to discuss the matter so that He executes. It's a place. If you are not there, don't try it. It's a progression. From friendship, then you break into bride. Now the bride is what every generation has been looking for. They, that's what they've been looking for is the bride, the one who has been made up for her husband to marry. It's friendship. When friendship consummates into its fullness, what it births between the church and Jesus is bride. Now, so notice that God was simply saying, "Today, if you hear my voice, my sheep, they know my voice." That means if a man does not know his voice, he can be born again, but he's not a sheep. Aha. Do you understand it? It's simple. The Lord is my shepherd. I shall not want. He makes me like that. What? How? By his voice. Did you notice that the Bible also had that day in John chapter 10? That the voice of a stranger, they will not follow. That means you have not actually arrived at true servanthood until the only voice that has a compelling authority in your life is the voice of God. Every Paul told you in First Corinthians chapter thirteen, he said there are as it may be many voices upon the earth, and none is without signification. It's not my business that many voices are speaking and they are signifying something. It is my business what my soul responds to. My soul on you, my mind on you. Set my affection on you. Sing it two times. Set my heart on you. My soul on you, my mind on. Set my affections on you. Things of heaven, things of heaven, fill me up. Set my heart on you. Set my heart on you. My soul on you. My mind on you. My soul on you. Come on, Tyler. 
respond only to the voice of God you know why when you arrive at friendship you will discover that what qualifies a man to be called the friend of God is the purity of his thought and the focus of his intent if the Lord permits you friendship when your soul responds to different kinds of voices, what will happen is that we will soon hear the voice of Satan speaking in the Sabbath. It will mean that you will take of your earthly interactions and you will force them into divine conversations. At the level of friendship, the only subject is the kingdom of God and his righteousness. That's the only subject. If a man becomes the friend of God, when they sit down, the only subject of discussion is how, Lord, how do we advance your kingdom? When last you ask God, Lord, how are you doing today? One day my wife prayed a prayer. I nearly jumped out of my skin. She said, Lord, tell me the things that are troubling you so that Men are used to telling God what troubles them. And my wife said, Lord, tell me the things that is troubling you. Then I actually realized that God is carrying body. And he's looking for a man who will bear it with him. It's easy for us to arrive at the presence of God complaining what is not in place. As a man of conversation. Now, so, if scripture said, God spared a day in David saying today, if you will hear his voice, and not your heart. If scripture said, God spared a day in David. Let's find out. What is the day he spared? Psalm 95, verse 1. Look at this. Stay with me, guys. It won't, it won't be too long. A few more minutes and I'm out of here. Oh, come. Let us sing unto the Lord. Let us make... A joyful noise to who? Oh, la man, I'm a See, I figured out that every psalm was deliberately written. And the introduction of God in every psalm was deliberately crafted. So when he said the rock of our salvation, it meant that David was actually saying, he's still our savior. He could have been angry with us. But his anger lasts only a moment. His favor will last a lifetime. We will turn in his direction. Even when he's angry with us. David said, I would rather fall into the hand of God. Than into the hand of my enemies. For with God, there is mercy. It's only a man who knows God that can say that. So when he called him the rock of our salvation. It was deliberate. Come let us sing unto the Lord. Let us make... A joyful noise to rock of our salvation. Let us come before his presence with thanksgiving. Make a joyful noise unto him with psalms. Why? For the Lord is a great God and is a great king above all gods. I listen. I must say this at this point, and I trust the Lord that you understand it. Until these things are written in your heart, yielding to God will be difficult for you. Can I say it again? If the sovereignty and the grandeur of God, you know, is 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 one thing to declare God great, is another thing to know God is great. When you arrive at knowing that God is great, how you know that you know it is that it will compel all your members to fear God. It will compel your members to fear God. You 
You are God of creation and God of my life. God of the land and the sea. You are God of the heavens before there was time. The God of all gods you will be. You are king of creation and king of my life. King of the land and the sea. You are king of the heavens before there was time. King of all kings you will be. We bow down and we crown you the king. We bow down and we crown you the king. We bow down and we crown you the king. See, the Lord our God is a great God and he's a great king above all gods. Let me tell you. So one of the elements that Israel lost in the wilderness was the fear of God. Listen. And one of the elements a generation is losing very fast is the fear of God. And this fear, I'm not talking about awe. I'm talking about terror. Listen. You need, God has to terrify you. There, there was nobody who met him that the first thing God said was not fear not. Come on, check it. Everyone who met him, the first thing God said is fear not. So Israel lost their fear of God. Now, please don't forget that we're also speaking about you. Because the Bible says the same gospel preached unto them. Many times God could not understand why these people don't fear him. No, you don't understand. God was perplexed as to why. why? One day he asked Aaron. He said, Aaron, have I ever spoken to you face to face before? He said, he said, not because of this gown that I gave you. What I'll have done to you now? They say, are you Miriam? You that did not give gown. <laughs> no, manche Miriam. Miriam. He said, are you Miriam? They... See how God honors his principle. He was the one who gave the priestly gown, but he will not defile it. What a God. What a God. He should be feared. We as men, if we were the ones... Then I me call you, I uncall you. If I anointed you, I won't anoint you. Do you know? I pastor you, I depastor you. Hey! So when the psalmist said in Psalm 2, the Lord has sworn and he will not change his mind. Thou art a priest forever. After the order of Melchizedek. So God establishes an order and even him cannot defile it. There's no amount of anger that will enter the brain of God that will make him defy his order. He's to be feared. He said to Miriam, he said, okay, show Aaron what you would have looked like right now. She turned white on the canvas head to the solar. I mean, do you realize that in the fall of man, is the fact that man has lost the ability in his heart to aggregate the greatness of God. I want to sing of your love. I want to sing of your mercy. I want to tell the whole world of the greatness of you. So I sing of your love And I sing of your mercy And I tell the whole world Of the greatness of you Jesus we lift up your name 
Jesus, we lift up your name. Jesus, we lift up your name. Oh. Jesus, we lift up. Come on, lift him up. We lift up your name. Jesus, we lift up your name. They said Yahweh. Sorry, no. When they said Elohim, blessed be His name. Go and check anything I send to you. I can never say Jesus. I'll never say Jesus Christ. I say the Lord Jesus. Go and check it. I'm not the Lord Jesus. I had to teach my members to know. That he's the Lord. Your members need to know it. That he is the Lord. That's where Islam stole that custom from. Every time a Jew calls his name, he stops in the midst of the sentence and says, Bless his name. Some traditions are good. Because the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. Now, I wish you heard me. The fear of who? The Lord. The, Lord. the Bible says, Now the Lord is that spirit. No, no, no. That means that Holy Spirit that you are in fellowship with is the Lord. See, I've always said, He gave us complex human relationships. So that we can understand complex divine relationships. That's how husbands and wives are. Ayo is your friend. He's your. But the moment he says, uh, even if he says, baby, get that cup for me. The moment it turns into an instruction, don't respond to your friend. That's where we miss it. Because the moment it turns into an instruction, your friend just became your Lord. If you miss it, you will miss the inheritance that comes from the office of his lordship. That's how the Holy Ghost is. Such a sweet fellowship we have with the Holy Ghost. No one reveals to us the Father like he does. Every time he comes, we just feel mushy. 
and it's a divine feeling it didn't start with us it will not end with us the moment he shows up you literally feel the warmth of the love of the father wrapping around you and it is in the stillness of that warmth that he tells you an instruction so sometimes the emotion make you lose sight of the Lord who is speaking so if you heard how Israel responded to God every time you will know that they lost a sense of his lordship they started to feel like it is our right to be taken care of in the wilderness do we need have you noticed Dr. Judith there was something Israel never did if Israel never prayed never they only complained there was not a single time and Israel turned unto the Lord and they said to the Lord oh thou great God who slayed Pharaoh's firstborn and all of the firstborns of Egypt. O oh, thou great God, who saw ten signs in Egypt, thou who split the Red Sea. Can you see how familiarity makes that you forget divinity? So that the mighty works of God can be commonized in your eyes the moment you start to feel the sense. Is the Lord. 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 Keep the consciousness of His Lordship. If not, you wake up one day, you'll be talking like He's your mate. And yet, you know that the relationship will be boring if He comes to fellowship with Him and all with you, and all you are doing is you are shrinking in. So one of the things I find in the New Testament very strongly is the switch. It's all over the New Testament. If you see the relationship of Jesus with people, the relationship of Jesus with the Lord, you, you will know that in this moment he's eating. The next moment he sees the purpose of his, the Father. His eyes just turn. Poop, like a flint. He's eating with them on a the table. A woman walks in. For them, a woman walks in. For him, a divine moment has come. And the ability to accurately interpret this is smack in my assignment. So I can't miss this moment. So, I remember this when I'm stretching on my bed and I'm saying to God, I'm tired. I'm like, God, must I pray today? Who are you talking to? Your friend. It's the Lord. If he said, wake up and pray. He was not suggesting. Did you hear me? The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. So go and check Israel. They lacked all. Came back that scripture on the board. I need to drive this very quickly. Came back that scripture on the board. You can sit down if you want to. In his hands are the deep places of the earth. Verse 4. Verse 4. In his hand are the deep places of the earth. The scent of the hills is his also. He said the sea is his. He made it. In his hands he formed the dry land. Did you see the psalmist taking the time to magnify him? Because if you don't see a right picture, you will not worship. If you don't worship, your heart will not tremble. If your heart does not tremble, you will harden your heart when he speaks. A six. Oh. Come, let us worship and bow down. Let us kneel before the Lord our maker. Why? For he is our God. And we are the people of his pasture. And we are the sheep of his hand today. If you will hear his voice. Uh, uh, oh. mm. How do I guarantee that what Israel missed, I will not miss
and the Bible suggested a physical position. Come, let us worship and bow down. Let us leave. You see, when you take physical looking, when you take physical positionings, you are informing your members that when this one speaks, we are not suggesting it. We are not, there's no debating it. Oh, he is our God. And we are the people of his pasture. And the sheep of his hands. Yes, the sheep of his hands. Come let us worship and bow down. Let us kneel before the Lord our God, our maker. Come let us worship and bow down. Let us kneel before the Lord our God, our maker. For he is our God, and we are the people of his pasture, and the sheep of his hands, yes, the sheep of his hands. Come, let us worship and bow down. Let us kneel before the Lord our God, our Maker. Come, let us worship and bow down. Let us kneel before the Lord our God, our Maker. For he is our God, and we are the people of his master, and the sheep of his hand, yes, the sheep. Restore again in the in the earth the true fear of the Lord. Restore again in the midst of your people the true fear of the Lord.
in your hands at the deep places of the earth. We humble ourselves before you. Lord, by the glory of your presence, slay everything in us that wants to rise up to you. Especially in the faces of circumstances that we do not understand. By the glory of your presence, slay everything in us that wants to rise up to you. Everything that questions the authority of your Lordship. Lord, let none of it rise from this earth with us. Let our soul be consistently constrained to remember that you alone are God. You are Lord of us. Lord of us. Let our soul hear it and know it very well. Jesus is Lord of us. The Holy Spirit sits in the office of his Lordship over us. The Father God sits upon the throne and is Lord over the whole earth. Lord of us. Let everything in us that contends give way. Let everything in us that attempts to display knowledge give way. We yield to you, Jesus. So I yield to you and to your careful hand. When I trust you, I don't need to understand. So I yield to you and to your careful help. When I trust you, I don't need to understand. So make me a vessel. Make me an offering. Make me whatever you want me to be. I came here with nothing, but all you have given me, Jesus, bring new wine out of me. Make me a vessel, make me a offering, make me whatever you want me. Say that again. Make me a vessel. Make me an offering. Make me whatever you want me to be. You want me to be. While we worship, let Paul just set up.
what we came for. There is new power. There is new freedom. The kingdom is here. Made out my own to carry a new fire. you will realize that the first outpouring was not enough that when these realizations come upon a generation they will have to compel what the bible calls the latter rain then the latter rain and the former rain will meet them in the first month if it is in this conference the lord chooses to release the rain then let him be glorified if not we will wait all the days of our appointed years Because what is available is not sufficient for what lies ahead. I'll give way to Minister Moako and he will worship for the next few minutes. And I'll return and finish that message in maybe an hour. Let's go ahead and worship the Lord.